Good evening, friends. On behalf of Annamalai University Engineering and Technology Alumni Association, I have great pleasure in welcoming you to participate in the storytelling session of, uh, by Mr. Mohan Krishnan. A picture is worth a thousand words, and a story is worth a thousand pictures. Storytelling describes the social and cultural activity. Every culture has its own stories, and one could draw lessons from it. Stories are a source of entertainment, education, cultural preservation, and instilling moral values. Mr. Mohan Krishnan would be telling stories from Ramayana, Mahabharata, Vikram or Betal, Akbar and Birbal, and stories from the folklore. A few words about Mr. Mohan Krishnan. Mohan Krishnan is a happiness coach, storyteller, and trains persons from software companies, banks, and other institutions, sharing life lessons through stories drawn from Indian Vedic heritage, folk tales, and real life personal and other stories. Mohan is an articulate speaker and is fluent in four languages. Tamil, Hindi, Bengali, and English. He has had a spiritual education from Pooja, Pooja Swami Dayananda Saraswati and some of Swamiji's accomplished students. Mohan draws life lessons from Mahabharata and Ramayana and realities and relates it to our everyday life. He is an ardent student of Kabir Das and he sings, sings them and draws life lessons from them. He is passionate about Hindi retro film music and has a small group that sings for connoisseurs. He has worked in a senior position with Reserve Bank of India before retirement. With these few words, I request Mr. Mohan to take over. Hello, Namaste everybody. So welcome to this evening's storytelling session. Uh, my name is Mohan Krishna and many people call me Mohan Kabir Krishna because I am fond of Kabir Das Dohe. This evening I propose to share a few stories with you. Stories drawn from Mahabharata. Ramayan, folk tales, Akbar Birbal stories, Vikram Betal stories, Tenali Lama stories. I'm not going to give you a lecture. I'm not going to preach. And there's nothing religious about it. I'm going to tell you some stories. But at least from these stories, if we can learn yeah. some lessons which we can implement in our day to day life, if you can reflect on these stories and if it can make a difference to your life, that's exactly going to be the effort. India's uh, cultural heritage is very, very old. It's more than 5,000 years old. And uh, two books they are referred to as history and they are also referred to as immortal poems by Ramayana and Mahabharata. So, I would like to start with a story comparing the situation both in Ramayana and in Mahabharata. As you all know, the protagonist of Ramayana is Sri Ram, Crown Prince of Ayodhya. He was exiled and he was moving in South India when his beautiful wife Sita was abducted by a king from the neighboring kingdom. The king was called Ram. When Sita was being abducted. Somebody heard her wailing voice. Somebody heard her voice calling out for help. The person was called Jatayu, very old, feeble person. And Jatayu saw who was abducting Sita. He knew the person who was abducting Sita was Ravan, the powerful king of Lanka a valiant warrior and he had no chance whatsoever in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with Ravan. Nevertheless, he went to fight and he was mortally wounded. He lived long enough to tell Ram where Sita was being taken to. Cut, I would like to quickly take you to another scenario. That scenario happened thousands of years later in the court of Hastinapura. The Pandavas had lost a game of dice to the Kauravas and in that they had staked their wife. And the Kauravas called Draupati to court and wanted to humiliate her. She was being 
humiliated and the Pandavas were slaves, they could not speak out. The court was full of very powerful warriors. One among them was a highly scholarly Bhishma. He was a warrior, he was an erudite scholar, his influence cut across kingdoms. He had a lot of influence in the society. And when Draupadi was being humiliated in the royal court, Bhishma chose to turn away. He chose to look away. Even when she wailed and pleaded to him for help. I want to look at these two scenarios. Women, when they call out for help, have to be helped. Jetayu's values was, come what may, even if I die. If a woman comes, calls out and when I know she is in trouble, I will help. It's not a sitting on judgment on anybody. It was a value that an old man had. A very weak, feeble man, but he fought. He fought for the rights. Much later, when a woman called out for help, a very powerful warrior like Bhishma did not lift a finger to help. All he had to do was to say stop, it would have stopped. But he didn't try to help. See, every decision of yours leads you to consequences. Jatayu also perished. But when he perished, his last, last rites were done by Sri Ram. He was given an honorable funeral. But when Bhishma died, he died a painful death, pierced by arrows. In today's scenario, with tubes sticking out of every hole in your body. He had a painful weight before he died. I only want to highlight that even society is not much different even today. There are people who run to help. There are people who make a lot of song and dance over the media. And there are people who don't care. What type are you? That's a question I would leave you with. That's a reflection I would love to ask you. I would like to ask you when it comes to women in trouble. What, what type are you? What drives you? Let's quickly go back to Ramayana and look at another story. The same story, I would look at a character called Ravan. Ravan was the king of Lanka. The Ramayana says that he had ten heads. I don't know whether he had physically had ten heads. But I would say, I would take the ten heads to be Highly accomplished qualifications equal to 10 heads. The person was so well qualified, he had so much scholarship that was worth 10 heads worth of knowledge. He was a valiant warrior. He had won over bigger warriors and many of the natural elements were under his control. That was the kind of valiant powers that he had. He was also a very accomplished musician. He was so good a musician that Kailash Pati Shiva was his fan. And uh, he had had musical sessions for Shiva. A person of such valor, such character, had a small flaw. The flaw was covetousness. He coveted others' property. He coveted others' women. In fact, the story says that Lanka was not his. Lanka belonged to his cousin. Ravan coveted Lanka, drove his brother out and annexed Lanka. He saw Mandodari and he abducted her and brought her home. Luckily, she was just a maiden and she agreed to marry him. Much later in life, he saw Sita. He knew Sita was Sri Ram's wife. He coveted him. It would have been valiant if he had waged a war. Won over Sita in a war, defeated Rama and brought her home. But no, he had opted to trickery and brought her home. And it says, when you covet other man's property, another man's wife, you know no peace. And not just you, even your house burns. They say Lanka burns even today. There is no peace in that country. 
it burns even today. Lanka burned. Who brought devastation on Lanka? Covetousness. Because he was told, return and honorably, he would listen. He brought about the death and devastation of his own kin. His brother died. His son died. Fighting for what? What was their cause? Kumbhakarna, the brother, asked Ravan, Oh dear brother, valiant one. Ravana was one of those few persons who had the name Ishwara after his name. After Parameshwara, Vigneshwara, Shaneshwara was only Lankeshwara was his name. He said, you are called Lankeshwara. You are such a valiant warrior. And you want me to fight Ram. No big deal. But tell me what's the cause. Ravan couldn't explain the cause. So Kumbhakarna says, you carry away another man's wife. Keep her imprisoned. And you want me to fight your war? You want me to fight Ram who has come to rightfully claim his wife. If you had so much influence over Sita, ask Sita to go to the war field and tell Ram, go back, I want to live with Ram. You can't convince Sita, can you? And you want me to fight your war. But I shall do your bidding and Kumbhakarna perished. Kumbhakarna had a great boon that if he was allowed to sleep the full quota of his six months, he would be invulnerable in war. Alas, they woke him one month ahead of time and he fell. There was another great warrior in the Lankan kingdom. His name was Indrajit, Meghnath. He had defeated Indra, so he was called Indrajit. And he was Ravana's valiant son. And Ravan summons Indrajit and says, go fight Ram, he is an invader. And uh, Indrajit asks his father a question, respectful father. Rama has invaded Lanka for what purpose? He is coveting our land, our property. He has come to claim his wife. And he has told you return, I will go back honorably. And you want me to fight for you, who has abducted another man's wife. Just short of asking him, are you not ashamed? May he not said anything. Meghnath also perished. In fact, his head was never found. So that was the devastation he wrought to his kingdom and to his king's land. Finally, he had to go to the war. He fought and on day one, he was defeated. Ram could have killed him. Ram showed him a great amount of compassion. He said, Ravan, go back. Come back again tomorrow. Bring Sita back to me honorably and I will spare your life. He wouldn't listen to him. And he died like an ordinary mortal. The story says that all his ten heads were gone and he lay, lay slain on the war field, on the floor of the war field. Ravan had an influential friend in Shiva, Kailashpati. He could he not have called Kailashpati for help. I want to ask you a question. Suppose you have very powerful friends in very powerful places and you have done something wrong. Willfully wrong. And you don't want to repent. Would you call the high officials in your high contacts to defend you? What face would you have to go and tell your high contact? I have made this blunder. At least if you say forgive me, I am willing to go through the sentence. That's okay. He says, I am not, I'm not repenting. I'm not repenting. I want to continue to hold on to what is not mine. Would you like to help me? He didn't have the face to go and tell Shiva, help me out. These are two beautiful episodes which say, even if you have the best of scholarship, if this doesn't work, there's, no, there's nothing at all. I would also like to look at the leadership models. Ram fought his war for his life. So his army followed an arrowhead formation. Ram led in the front, from the front, and his warriors followed him. So when the cause is yours, when pers your personal stake is higher in any cause, please lead from the front. 
Ravan on the other hand, it was his personal cause. There was no cause. There was an illegitimate cause. He led from behind and he asked people to fight for him. They say very often when the Indian army has these border skirmishes with our neighbors, the Indians come out victorious essentially because of the courageous me first principles shown by the Indian army. They lead from the front. They don't lead from behind. So, this is an amazing lesson in leadership that we have to learn. If the stakes are high, and if your personal stakes are high, don't run and hide. Face the situation. It's a beautiful story that we can get to. Lessons we can draw from both Mahabharata and Rama. In Mahabharata, I would like you to look at another character. We are not sitting on judgment on any of these characters. I'm just looking at these characters. There is a character called Karma, a great warrior, is a warrior of such capacity that he could defeat all five Pandavas on the same day. That was his valence, that was his power, that was his accomplishment. But he had a problem. He had a problem of self-non-acceptance. He suffered from low self-esteem. He suffered from such low self-esteem that he gave so generously so that people, so that his self-esteem would go up in the eyes of the people. His esteem would go up in the eyes of the people. It's not questioning his generosity. I'm not questioning Karna's generosity, but I'm questioning the purpose behind the generosity. Did he give because he wanted to give? Or did he give because he wanted people to say he's a Dana Veera? Sometimes his giving bordered on the knife. Then there was a war to be fought with Arjun. Indira came to Karna and said, I have something to ask you. Karna could see through the disguise. He could see that it was Indira. And he said, ask what you want. Indira said, give me a kavacha and kundal. He gave away his defenses. Imagine you are running an IT company and you said for your enemy you would wind up your uh, what, uh, firewall in your security. What do you call it? Naivate. Who's name? Then he also had questionable values. He wanted to learn something from Parashurama. Parashurama school said, I will teach only this class of people. That school's principle. You can't question that. That's school's principle. He lied. He gave them a false caste certificate and found out they confiscated all his degrees and barred him from practice. And then he picked up uh, a quarrel with Bhishma because of ego. So a very valiant character who always lived a very confused kind. Again from this episode, I'm going back to Mahabharata. I want to look at two stories on how do you handle crisis and what responsibility do you take to handle crisis. This is a problem solving or problem facing lessons from these two stories. There was a Rishi called Vishwamitra, a very accomplished Rishi. He had a lion in Vita divine woman, heavenly nymph, and because of that liaison, a child was born. And when this nymph came to him and said, what do I do with the child? What was Vishwamitra's response? He said, none of my business. It's yours. It's your baby, not mine. Many of us have these kind of crisis handling situation. We find a Skateboard and says, yes, I have nothing to do with it. I have come across people, they say, if there is a problem, you solve it. If there are credits, share it. Cut, go back to another character in the same Mahabharata. This Rishi was called Parashara. Parashara also had a liaison with a woman, with a boat woman. They had a liaison. And in that liaison, a child was born. 
this lady, her name was Matsya Ganda, approached Parashara and said, I am a maiden, I come from a very poor background and you have blessed me with a child. What do I do? Where do I go for a living? What happens to my reputation? Look at Parashara's crisis handling technique. He said, don't worry maiden, your name will not be tarnished. So they say Matsya Ganda, the woman who smelt like a fish, became Satyavati. Okay, symbolic of saying that a fall did not disgrace her. Because Parashara said, I will own up parenthood. I the world, I will claim to the world that the child born is mine. I will take care of the birth of the, not only the birth, the upkeep, the education of the child. You all know who the child is, Vyasa. So when we read Vyasa's life, we glorify Vyasa's life. We don't condemn Vyasa as an illegitimate child. Quote Kabir Das. Kabir Das says, Jati na puche sadhu ki pooch lijiye gyan mol karo talwar ki that means when you meet a sadhu, when you meet an accomplished person, when you meet a scholarly person, don't look at his background. Vyasa's background. You want to look at Vyasa's background. Find out what he has to teach. And he compares it to a sword. Imagine you have a very beautiful sword. Would you look at the scabbard and look at its value or would you value the blade? Mol karo talwar ki pada rehne do bhyan, that's what Kabir Das says. So we had these stories. Also let's look at Mahabharata stories. Some more stories from the Mahabharata. There is a, a gambling exercise going on. The stakes are high, they are playing for high stakes. Duryodhan says, I will put the stakes my mama will throw the dice. In such a scenario, if you are on the opposite side, if you are competing with him for high stakes, what should be your take? Why doesn't Yudhishthir go and say, I will give the stakes, Krishna will throw the dice. The game would have changed. Why don't you do that? Think. So, they say, we all talk about brain fade. All your scholarship, all your knowledge, it takes a few seconds for saying something which you should not have said or not saying something which demands to be said. It just calls for a small failure. Most of the stories from Mahabharata highlight this. I would like to actually take you to the war field where there is a war going on between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Who do you think was the commander in chief was the Pandava of the Pandava army? It was not Arjuna. It was not Dhrishtya. It was Dhrishtadyumna. Because on the other side there was Dronacharya. And Dronacharya and Dhrishtadyumna's father had a long rivalry. Dronacharya was instrumental in getting, in defeating Dhrishtadyumna's father in a war and annexing his kingdom. So, strategically put someone who has a lot of personal stick. So, Dhrishtadyumna was made the commander in chief. If you look at every strategy, the Mahabharata has so many stories for you. So many stories for you. The war has stories. I am going to take you to the situation where there is a chakra view in front. And in front of the chakra view, they have a suicide squad, a suicide bomber squad attacking Arjun. Krishna is the charioteer. Krishna made a promise, I will ride the chariot, I will not fight your war. As a charioteer, what was Krishna's duty? His job was to protect his master, so he drove the chariot away from the suicide bombers. He took the suicide bombers to the end of the war field. They destroyed themselves and he came back to the center of the war field. By the time it was too late, Abhimanyu entered 
the chakra view and perished. Lessons. Never start something you cannot finish. That lesson is for Abhimanyu. Arjun asks Krishna, why did you not defend Abhimanyu? Krishna says, what was my contract? My contract was to defend you, not to defend Abhimanyu. I lost a son. That's what Arjun says. Krishna says, my sister also lost a son. You have three, three or four wives and you have a number of sons. My sister has one son. I am answerable to her. You can ask me, why did you defend Abhimanyu? When Subhadra asked me, why did you defend Abhimanyu? What do I have to say? So remember, when there is collateral damage, a lot of people do get affected. It's not just I who are affected. Very often when we face crisis, we tend to look at the problems only as ours. When you expand your vision, you will discover that all of us have our own bag to carry. We all have problems. Okay. So let's come out of Mahabharat, Ramayana, okay, and get into nearer periods. I would like you to listen to a story or two from Akbar Birbal time. These also have lessons for you. Uh, you can learn a lot of lessons from Akbar Bilbal stories. There's even a book available you could invest in that. I'm not marketing any of these books. Akbar had a court and he had a nine gems in his court. One of the gems was Bilbal. Bilbal was very witty, very wise, and uh, Obviously, the witty and the wise also have a lot of enemies. It must be your personal experience as well. You have enemies in the front and you have enemies hidden. The enemies in the front can be easily handled. The hidden enemies are difficult to handle. So, Birbal had his share of hidden enemies as well. One of them was a wazir. The wazir had access to Akbar's barber. And, uh, you know, barbers have a lot of influence on you. Okay, these days it's all, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's ages since people have gone to a barber shop the last eight months because of the pandemic. Okay, when you go to a barber and the fellow is shaving you and he asks you a question, can you nod your head this way? You'll end up having a slit throat. So you always have to nod like this. So what happened was, Akbar was being given an excellent shave by his barber and the barber told uh, Akbar, he is a Jahapala. Last week, our, you know, I had special, you know, I have psychic powers. I had power to go to heaven and I had to, I, I got to meet your Wali Sahab. Wali Sahab means father, Humayun. Now, Akbar, for all his uh, you know, royal scholars, it's only a story, for all his royal scholarliness and things like that, believed the barber and said, what did my father say? The barber says that your father is otherwise okay, but he is very unhappy there because there is nobody like Birbal in heaven. And Humayun says, please send Birbal here on a deputation. So how does Birbal go to heaven? He also has a solution. He said, bury him alive. Anybody who is buried alive will directly go to heaven. So Akbar summoned. He said, Birbal, come. This is what is going to happen. I am going to bury you and you go to heaven and entertain my father hereafter. Now can you argue against the king? Birbal said, okay, king, give me a few days time. Let me prepare. I have to prepare my family. Then he commissioned the people and he identified a place where he should be buried. He said, if I bury here, I will go direct to heaven. And from that burial, from the tomb, he dug an underground passage to his home. So on one particular day, at an auspicious time, Birbal was buried in the tomb and entombed. Birgal quietly made his way home through the tunnel and reached home and spent the next eight months to one year comfortably at home. One fine morning after about 10 or 11 months, Birbal came to Ambar's court. At that time, 10 months of unshaven whiskers. And he, when he came in, Ambar couldn't recognize him. Ambar said, who is this unkempt fellow? He said, Jahapana, are you not able to recognize Birbal? He said, oh Birbal, when did you come? He said, I have just arrived from heaven. He said, so good. He hugged him warmly, 
and he said, what does my father have to tell? How is my father? Is he happy? He said, your father is delighted now. But the only problem is there are no barbers up there. So Humayun has even a longer beard. You have to find a barber to send him. Now the Akbar said, come on, call that barber. Bury him, let us go to heaven. The barber confessed, sorry, it was my mistake. I only had a conspiracy to take care of people. So if you have hidden conspirators, hidden enemies, you need a chaturya. You can't attack an enemy directly if you don't know that. If you don't know there is a hidden enemy, you have to tackle him differently. There is a beautiful story on Akbar Birpal on how to tackle hidden enemies. Okay? Let me take you to one more story. This story is also from the folklore. It is drawn from Vetal Pachisi. So, the Vikram Vetal story goes like this that Raja Bhoj dug, he excavated something and in the excavat excavation he found a throne. The throne looked so majestic that Raja Bhoj took that throne, installed it in his capital, looked for an auspicious time and uh, was ready to ascend and sit on the throne. Every day he stepped on the stone, one of the statues spoke to him. There were 25 statues. Each of them spoke to him and asked him a question, are you fit enough to ascend this throne? That's how the Pachis, 25 stories came. Okay. So one such story, the statue tells the story to, uh, to this Raja. Now, Vikram is carrying a Vetal on his shoulders. The Vetal speaks to Vikram. The Vetal says, if you answer my question, I will immediately fly back to the tree where I was seated. And at the end of the story, I am going to ask you a question. And if you stay silent, even after knowing the answer, then I will get the powers to break your head. So it is a catch 22. If you know the answer and do not answer, you are killed. If you open your mouth, I fly back to the tree. So you have to fetch me all over again. Okay, many of us face such catch, catch 22 situations in life. Open your mouth, trouble. Keep it close to trouble. Okay. So, Vetal tells the story. Vetal says, once upon a time, four travelers were going through a heavily wooded area at night. And they had to rest. They couldn't travel at night. So they had to necessarily rest. And when they rested, there was a there was rumors from the village and things like that that there is an ogre living in that wooded area. And if you slept on that particular night, the ogre would eat you. Even if one person slept, it would eat that person. So four people were there. All four decided they will exhibit their talents and show it to the others so that they keep themselves awake, they keep others awake and they stay awake the whole night. And they time the problem so they can sleep during the day perhaps. So each one talks about his talent. One person says, traveler A, he says, I am a sculptor. I can sculpt real life like images out of any of these woods. And he offers to sculpt the image of one of the loveliest women on earth. The other person, second person, person B, he says, I am a sorcerer. And I can put, breathe life into this one. And there was a third person. They were all ready. So the sculptor is working on the woman, the other person is ready to breathe life. There was a third guy, guy who is a C. The C stands for a cloth here. Okay. He says, how would it be if you had a beautiful woman coming to life and she was improperly dressed? So the clothier said, I will clothe her. Clothes were made. Again, just before coming to life, the fourth one, he said, a woman without jewels, 
looks amangala. She doesn't look beautiful enough. You need alanka. You know, in the Indian middle, we don't use the word makeup at all. Makeup means you make up for what you don't have. We use the word alangar. Alankar means you know enhancing. It doesn't make up for what you don't have. It enhances the beauty of what you have. So we have alankar. He says, for alankara, I will create abharana, jewels, jewels. So he created jewels and some of the best jewels in the world were designed. And there he bestows a gorgeous woman, charm, fair complexion, flowing tresses, limpid eyes, straight nose, looking absolutely gorgeous. It caused flutter in everybody's heart. And I have to swallow hard, causing, causing, causing a flutter here. So beautiful. Such a beautiful woman appeared. All these four got into a squabble. The fellow says, I sculpted the image, so she is mine. The fellow says, I put life into her, she is mine. The third fellow says, I gave her clothes, she is mine. The fourth fellow says, I am the jeweler, I am mine. She is mine. They were squabbling. Now you are Vikram. I am Betal. If you know the answer and don't, I break your head. Tell me who should marry. Okay? You can message the answer in the comments card. Okay? But I'll tell you the answer. What did Vikram say? Vikram said, the person who sculpted the physical image is the father. Obviously, the father cannot marry the child. The person who breathed life into the woman is God. Obviously, God cannot marry his subjects. You have to marry everybody. That's two thoughts. The clothier and the jeweler. The clothier is a brother. Okay? They say, you can give clothes to a woman even without looking at her. Suppose a woman is trying to cover her honor. You have got valiant heroes. You know, you have seen so many Indian movies. Not just Indian movies, so many movies all over the world. The hero looks away, takes off his dhoti and gives. Doesn't bother how dirty it is, but he gives. So you can give clothes to a woman even without looking at her. But you can't buy jewelry for a woman without looking at her. When you look at a woman and give her jewelry, that means you admire her, not only her beauty in general, you specifically admire her physical beauty. So only one who quotes her can appreciate her physical beauty. I will not say only a husband can buy. Anybody who sincerely quotes that lady can buy her jewelry. From this has come out a cultural habit of ours. Imagine the teenage children at home are friendly with guys and girls around. Suppose your daughter brings home a bracelet or a ring or a gold jewelry given to by her boyfriend. As a father and mother, what do you say? Don't accept gold jewelry. Why not? This is the culture. Gold jewelry or jewelry in, 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 in a sense is accepted only from the one who quotes you. That's why these days the engagement they exchange rings. Much, many of our cultural practices have come out of this. Beautifully come out of this. Let me take it to one more story. Two more stories I'll tell you. So maybe it's if I can have time, I'll tell you three stories. This story comes from Tenali Rama times. Again, there was a king. All kings are very wise, very brave, but they all have moments of brain failure when they don't listen to proper advice. So this king also had a problem. His wife was not well. There was a, a physician a herbal physician, Ayurveda physician, I don't know if it was Ayurveda or not. It was definitely not an allopathic physician. It was a, a physician. The physician came in and he treated her with medicines and so many things, and pattiyam, things like that. And the queen recovered her health fully. The Raja was so overwhelmed. He said, Vaidhyare, O oh medicine man, Ask what you want from me and I'll give it to you. Now this medicine man had a problem. 
He had cure for everybody's illness. He had, didn't have a cure for his own illness. His own illness was for generation after generation in his family, nobody had hair on their head. They were all clean, clean, maybe from birth, I don't know. They were all clean, absolutely clean shaven hair. Nobody had hair. And as a medicine man, he couldn't find medicine for himself. So this uh, physician told the king that, look, I have failed. I heard that there is a physician, a herbal person in your kingdom. Please ask him to prescribe something for me so that I can grow hair. At least before, one day before I die or something. I am already an old man. Can you not do that? So the Raja summoned and he said, he has cured the queen. So you better grow hair on his head. He said, sir, how is it possible? He said, your highness, these things are sometimes hereditary. What can I do about it? Either you, the, you, you, grow, you grow hair on his head or your head is gone. Very often, the situation is that. The devil and the deep blue sea, you grow hair on his head or your head is gone. This fellow was in great problem. And then finally he gave up. Well, he was put in prison and he was on the death row. Maybe seven days from now he would be executed. That's when Tenali Rama came in touch with that fellow. He asked him, what is the problem? So this fellow said, this is a problem. He said, you ask the king for one more chance. Just one more chance. So he was given one more chance. The herbal doctor came. This herbal doctor came. And uh, Tananayama was also present there. And this doctor said that the doctor of this kingdom told the doctor from the other kingdom, I will grow hair, no problem at all. Here is an oil bottle. You have to apply this oil three times a day. In the morning, remember, right to left. In the evening, left to right. In the afternoon, back and forth. And you have to follow Patiya. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. All said and done. If you do this, in 15 days, hair will start growing. And after that, it will never stop. This person was thrilled. And as he was about to walk away, then I reminded this person, Sir, 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 you forgot to tell him one condition. He said, Oh yeah, I forgot, please come, I have to give you one condition. Remember, when you are applying the oil, don't think of a monkey. Fifteen days later, this doctor came back and said, I don't want hair, but please remove the monkey from my mind. The only thing I can think of is monkey. I used to know only a small monkey. Now I know proboscis monkeys, lion-tailed monkeys, gorillas, apes, orangutans. Only monkeys live in my mind. Remove the monkey. So many of us are carrying monkeys on our shoulders, monkeys on our heads, which prevents you from taking decisions. We have 15 wakeful hours per day. I assume you sleep for 9 hours. If you don't sleep, you may be lying down for 9 hours. How do you spend those 15 wakeful hours? The monkey on your back, monkey on your head. Wonderful story from Tanaka. Okay. Last one. The last story is drawn from a very famous storyteller from Tamil Nadu. He has written a book and the books are full of very, very thoughtful stories. Stories that can make a difference to your lives. This story is Tenalia is from Tenkachi Goswaminathan, an amazing writer, an amazing storyteller. The books are in Tamil, all of us should be. Very beautiful story. He says there was a sadhu and a young man from the village who was known for his integrity, a very scholarly young man, known for his integrity. And he came to the sadhu and said, Sadhu, there is a rich man in this village. He is going on a long pilgrimage. There is no one at home. And I am known for my straightness of character, integrity. So that man says, please take care of my young, nubile, beautiful daughter till I come back. Now what should I do? Okay. The sadhu says, do something. You want an answer? Please go to the nearest village. There is a guy there. You go meet him. Who has got a similar experience. So this young man went to that village. He looked far and wide. He couldn't find anybody. He could find only a madman. Hair grown 
And he came back and said, there's a bad man there. There is no wise man. He says, no, no, go steep, talk to him if possible. So he went back to the village. And there he found this man. Naturally, madcap, long hair. Dirty, tattered clothes. And he was drinking from a goblet. And he was drinking ordinary water from a goblet. And his son was pouring the, filling the goblet. He, his curiosity got better of him. He went to this madman and asked him, What is it happening? Are you mad? He said, No, no, I'm not mad. He said, Why are you drinking? He said, I'm drinking only water. Why are you drinking it out of a goblet? He said, Let me tell you a story. In the village from which you came, there is a rich man. And the rich man wants to go on a pilgrimage. And he wants to leave his beautiful daughter under your, my care. So what's the best way to avoid? Act as a madman and act as a drunkard. He will never come to you. <laughs> Tell the story, he says. Very often, you don't answer. You don't have answers. You have to figure out an answer. Life throws challenges at us all the time. There is no escape from challenges. Life those challenges and you have to make challenges. Stories from our folklore, stories from the Indian heritage gives you, give you wisdom, help you reflect. The world today needs storytellers, needs healers, people who can make you think. Remember, you have to make a decision. I can't decide. Any decision that you make has consequences. We must be ready to face the consequences of our decision. The consequences follow you all through your life. There is no escape. That's called karma. Karma is not somebody with, uh, chasing you with a trident. Karma is the consequences of your own decision. I recommend each one of you, please get into reading your stories. As families, read with your family. Don't send your children to storytelling classes and you do something else. Read stories. Make the children think. There is a way out. Every problem is a solution in disguise. If you, had, if you see, you know, in school, high school, we had something called an equation. What's an equation? Left side is equal to right side, but they don't look equal. If it was not equal, they wouldn't call it an equation. The left side is equal to the right side, but there is an apparent difference. You have to figure out and find out left side is equal to right side, QED. That's what life is all about. Stories tell you, look at your left side, look at your right side, find out, figure out, live happily. That's what these stories do. And I will leave, I leave you with a thought. Be a voice. Don't be an echo. We have so many people's thoughts to echo. That's there. Everybody echoes. Everybody's echo. But be a voice. People will listen to you. Your children will listen to you. Your family will listen to you. Have a great evening. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohan, for such lovely stories and the narration. Your fluency made the storytelling session really superb. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohan. We need a lot of storytellers, and I, I, I strongly recommend to our alumni association to have Mr. Mohan telling his stories in the near future, uh, in the coming months. Thank you very much. With this, the session is closed. Thank you. Bye.